Hi, and welcome to this new series of videos, videos that will inform us about metallurgy, more particularly metallurgy of steels and steel alloys, ferrous metals in general. In this series of videos, we're also going to talk about cutting speeds and feeds. We're going to talk about heat treatment of ferrous metals. We're going to talk about chip formation and how to produce a proper cutting action. And we're also going to talk about recognizing different steel alloys. I guess the best place to start would be to just ask the question, what is steel? Well, steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. A lot of iron and a little bit of carbon. We're talking here somewhere between 0.1 and 0.8% of carbon. But that's not all we need to have steel. For it to be called steel, it has to be put into form mechanically. We're talking here about laminating. We're talking here about forging or drawing. Drawing not as in producing a drawing, but drawing steel through a die. These mechanical ways of putting it into shape provides the steel with its properties and are important in the making of steel. So if steel is not formed mechanically, it's just not steel. It's a block of ferrous metal. Now, ferrous metals can be divided into two large families. The first family would be the cast irons. And the second family would be the steels. Now these families can be subdivided. So if we look at the cast irons, we can say that there are three main types of cast irons. There are the gray cast irons, the white cast irons, and the malleable cast irons. If we look at the steel side of the family, we can say that steels can be divided into two large families the plain carbon steels and the alloy steels. The plain carbon steels, well there are only three types. Low carbon steel, medium carbon steels, and high carbon steels. The alloy steels, however, can be divided into a multitude of groups, almost tailor-made for specific jobs. For simplicity's sake, because alloy steels are such a vast family of steels, I'm only going to present two different groups of steels and a specific alloy. We're going to talk about stainless steels and tool steels, which are two performance-based groups of steels. And we're going to talk about SAE 4140, which is a specific alloy steel it is a medium carbon steel designed for its ease of heat treatment. I'm hoping that these three descriptions helps us to understand the importance of tailoring steel's properties to the job that we have to produce. Now it may seem a little odd that our steel family is divided into two groups, carbon steels and alloy steels. When I said just moments ago that to have steel, we need a mix of iron and carbon. It's important to note that the difference between plain carbon steel and alloy steels is that plain carbon steels contain only iron and carbon, whereas the alloy steels contain iron, carbon, and other elements. So let's start with the cast iron side of the equation. Cast irons contain iron and carbon, but are not steels for two reasons. First off, the carbon content is way too high. Secondly, they are not mechanically formed. They are poured into molds. Now they are not mechanically formed because their high carbon content makes it very difficult to deform them. Cast irons are not at all malleable. Okay, so let's look at our gray cast iron. Now if you take a mixture of iron and about 1.7 to 4.5 percent carbon in its molten state and you pour that mixture into a mold that will cool it slowly, generally a sand mold, 
well you will obtain what's called gray cast iron. Gray cast iron is the least expensive of the ferrous metals. It is easily put into shape by pouring into sand molds. It's this pouring of molten metal into sand molds that gives it its gray, scaly, rough finish. Gray cast iron is very resistant in compression. It is also a good bearing surface because it contains so much free carbon that acts as a natural lubricant. This is why we find it used so often as engine block or cylinder walls in engines. Gray cast iron is readily machinable and it produces fine sand-like chips, almost powdery. One should never use lubricants or cooling liquids when machining gray cast iron. On the downside, gray cast iron is very brittle. It cannot be deformed in any way and it is absolutely not resistant to shock. Now, our white cast iron is chemically identical to the gray cast iron, but it is molecularly quite different. To produce white cast iron, we have to pour the molten iron carbon mixture into a ceramic mold, which cools it rapidly. This rapid cooling down produces a martensitic structure that is extremely hard. White cast iron is more resistant to shock and traction than gray cast iron, but it's really its hardness that we're looking for when we choose it as a material for making parts. White cast iron is not readily machinable. Water jet cutting, laser cutting, and grinding are about the only ways to change its form. A good example of the use of white cast iron would be the teeth in a rock crusher. To produce malleable cast iron, we have to first produce white cast iron. And we have to anneal that white cast iron to produce malleable cast iron. When we anneal the white cast iron, we eliminate its hardness and eliminate also the stresses and strains that it contain. This produces a malleable cast iron that is a lot more resistant in traction than the other cast irons. It is also readily machinable. We find malleable cast irons used in places like plumbing at T's and 90 degrees for steel pipes because we want something that resists to the movement of the pipe and won't break easily when a slight traction is applied, as well as being readily machinable so that we can cut the thread in the pipe fittings uh, required to assemble the pipes. One last thing about cast irons in general. A cast irons are excellent materials for many, many applications, but too often they're used by manufacturers simply because they're cheap and in those cases it's really not a good thing. So now let's take a look at our steel side of the ferrous metals family. Now you can see that we've divided the steels into two large groups. The plain carbon steels and the alloy steels. The plain carbon steels are the least expensive steel family. There are three types of plain carbon steels. Low, medium, and high plain carbon steels. They are divided that way in low, medium, and high carbon content because of what can be done with them. Mild steel or low carbon steel cannot be heat treated, so it's to be used as is. It is very malleable. Medium carbon steel is a lot less malleable but it can be hardened to a medium level. High carbon steel is not malleable at all, but it can be hardened to a high degree of hardness. Mild carbon steels are generally used in structural applications, whereas medium carbon steels are used when shock resistance and resistance to wear are required. High carbon steels are generally reserved for low-grade
cutting tools. The plain mild carbon steels are available in structural bars such as H-beams, I-beams, C-channels, and so on. They are also available in bar stock, round, square, hexagonal, and so on, either hot rolled or cold rolled. They can also be had in plate form, hot and cold rolled, and in sheet metal, which is almost invariably cold rolled steel. Medium carbon steels, however, are available in bar stock and in plate form, either hot rolled or cold rolled. The high carbon steels, however, are generally only available in hot rolled bar stock. Now, it's important to note that these three plain carbon steels are not all hardenable. The low carbon steel just doesn't have enough carbon in it to be quenched. But the medium and high carbon steel do. But seeing as they're plain carbon steels, they have to be quenched in water. And the hardness penetration, or the depth of hardness obtained after quenching, well, it's not very good on these plain carbon steels. And now for the group of steels that gives me cramps, mostly because it's going to be almost impossible to explain. Mainly because it's such a large or vast group of steels, and we're talking about the alloy steels. It is a vast group because it's almost limitless what we can join as far as elements to steel to make different properties for a steel. To keep things as simple as possible and to make it as easy as possible to explain, I've kept my choices for the alloy steels to three basic types. The stainless steels, the tool steels, and the medium carbon alloy steels. The two first alloy steels that we're looking at the stainless steels and the tool steels are performance based classifications. What does that mean? Well it means that it's what they do as far as performance that makes them stainless or tool steels, not necessarily the alloying agents that they contain. As a general rule, stainless steels are composed of iron, carbon, chrome and nickel. They are considered stainless because they resist corrosion and they resist oxidation. In other words, stainless steels do not rust easily. It is however important to note that stainless steels for the most part are very difficult to cut and that many stainless steels are not attracted to magnets. The alloy tool steels, however, and they're often called high-speed steels, are mixtures of iron and carbon and either tungsten or molybdenum. Now these alloying agents make for a steel that is very hard, very tough, very wear resistant, and that stays tough, hard, and wear resistant even at high temperatures. That's why they're classified as tool steels. The third steel that I've chosen as an example for alloy steels is a medium carbon alloy steel. I didn't choose it because it's a family or it's part of a large group. It's really just an alloy steel. It's an alloy steel as any other thousands of different alloys that you could make up. So the reason why I've chosen a medium carbon alloy steel is to make the demonstration of how we can tailor make steels for specific applications. As mentioned before, plain medium carbon steels can be hardened, but the depth or the penetration of hardness is not very good. Also, we need a huge thermal shock, so we have to quench them in water. This has a tendency to deform or crack complex parts. Now, the medium carbon alloy steel that I've chosen as an example is SAE 4140. 4140, what does it mean? Well, it's pretty simple. The two first numbers in the series of four numbers that designate a steel are the numbers that indicate the specific alloys of that steel. In our case, 
4140. So the 41 represents a chrome nickel molybdenum alloy. So our 4140, we've seen what the 41 means. What does the 40 mean? Well, the last two numbers represent the percentage of carbon in one hundredths of a percent. In other words, 4140 is a chrome nickel molybdenum steel that contains 0.4% of carbon. So that means that this steel is a medium carbon steel, that it can be quenched and hardened. So what's the advantage of choosing this steel over a cheaper plain carbon steel, like let's say a 1040? Now the 10 in the 1040 means that there are no alloying elements other than carbon and iron. So we have 4140 and 1040. Both contain 0.4% carbon. Both steels can be heat treated and will come out about at the same hardness. So what is the advantage of paying more for an alloy steel? Well in this case the advantage is that our 4140 requires a smaller thermal shock for hardening than our 1040 does. This means that we can quench our 4140 in oil rather than water as was the case with the 1040. This is a smaller and slower thermal shock. Less chance for deformation, less chance for cracking. This also means a much deeper hardness penetration. Now these are major advantages that will make us choose in many cases that expensive alloy steel. This is a security alert. Quenching steel in oil is extremely dangerous. Never use anything but an approved heat treatment oil for quenching steels. Heat treatment oils have flash points that are higher than their normal burning temperature, which means that if a fire does start at the surface of the basin, it will extinguish itself. If you do use regular oil for quenching steels, well you will most certainly produce a large fire and even probably an explosion. Take the time to look at the heat treatment video that I produced. Pay particular attention to the quenching portion of that movie because even if you use heat treatment oil for quenching your steel, it is still a very dangerous operation. Now there are many, many types of alloy steels. My best suggestion for someone who's just starting out would be to go and talk to your steel provider. Inquire about which type of alloy would be best suited for the job at hand. If nothing else, by now in our first video, I hope that you realize that steel and ferrous metals in general are a little bit more complex than just something you can put a magnet on. There are questions we need to answer before we start machining. Is the ferrous metal a cast iron? Is it a steel? If it's a cast iron, is it a gray cast iron, a white cast iron, or a malleable cast iron? If it's a steel, is it a medium, high, or low carbon steel? Or is it an alloy steel? If it is a steel, has it been quenched and hardened? How hard is it? Before we start to cut, before we put a piece of steel onto a milling machine or a lathe, we have to know these answers because it could lead to an accident or at the very least wasting a good expensive cutting tool. So before you start cutting, I invite you to watch the next three videos in this series of videos on ferrous metals. Now the second video has to do with differentiating different steels. The third video has to do with heat treatments. How to perform hardening, quenching, tempering, annealing on ferrous metals. The fourth video has to do with cutting action, chip formation, and calculating feeds and speeds. So keep a stiff upper lip. I know these videos are a lot more theoretical than I'm used to making for practical projects in the shop. But it's important to learn these things. Quite often, knowing a little bit about metallurgy and ferrous metals will make the difference between a successful project and a disaster.
Happy machining.